Um, uh, if you would like to stand up and get something to eat or drink, go right ahead. We will, however, continue to move on with questions and answers. And we are, I am going to be the person who's going to point out who gets to ask the question. And we have mics on either side. So if you would like to address a question to any one of the, our panelists, Dr. Ingrafia or Dr. Barth or Dr. Steingraber, you are, this is your chance to do it now before, before they head off to their homes. Is for, this question is for Professor Ingrafia. What are the data for the upward migration of frac fluids into overlying fresh aquifers in terms of distance and in terms of time? And I'm referring not just to groundwater or shallow aquifers, but also to rather deep aquifers, three, four, or 500 feet below ground level. After all, as uh, Dr. Steingreber pointed out, these deep aquifers often terminate, perhaps miles away, where they're intercepted by a hillside at a spring, which creates or feeds a stream, a wetland, or a body of water. Uh, thank you for that excellent question. Is this working okay? So the direct answer to your question is there is no data. Uh, as Dr. Steingraber just pointed out, there are so many questions involving the science, the technology, and engineering of shale gas development that we haven't answered. One has to wonder why we have a policy, a national policy, to continue developing it before we know the answers. That's the direct answer. The indirect answer is next Tuesday and Wednesday in North Carolina, at the EPA Research Park in North Carolina, there will be a workshop. The workshop title is Wellbore Integrity in Underground Flow into Underground Sources of Drinking Water from Hydraulic Fracturing. That workshop is part of an ongoing EPA study that started three years ago to answer the question, is there data or can we use what you've already heard tonight from three of us computer simulation based on the best science to predict what the impacts would be. So I have been invited to attend that workshop. I'm going to be giving a talk at that workshop. And that will be the first time that the public will have an opportunity, the 100 or so people who will be in attendance, to hear what the preliminary results are. So there are studies undergoing, ongoing right now. Those studies are being performed by people in the oil and gas industry, by people in academia, and by people in our national laboratories, the best and the brightest in all three regimes, are putting their brains together and trying to answer your question. What is the probability that as a result of hydraulically fracturing a shale gas or shale oil well, that there can be so-called upward migration or lateral migration into an underground source of drinking water, be it deep or shallow? How much upward migration can occur how long will it take, and what would the impact be? That's a long answer to a very important, simple question we don't know. Thank you. Okay. Reverend Bell. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. This was very enlightening. Um, I, I have one comment and, and then a question. My, my comment is uh, with regard to um, the, a, a campaign that really involves more of, of the grassroots and, 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 and perhaps talking uh, where there are people, um, you, you don't have a lot of, I don't see a whole lot of diversity here. <laughs> and, and, and I think that part of the campaign uh, is, 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 is taking a look at the propaganda that's being utilized. I say that because uh, when I pastored in, in Ithaca at, at St. James, I, I know some of you from there and, and Tree Cook from over your area, um, it, it was important as it was here, the church that I pastor here, we uh, argued for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. We could not do those kinds of things running the circuits without propaganda being used to counter 
uh, in many instances, what you're encountering are the capitalist thrust. And, and the one thing that I'm troubled by is that your expansion of your argument is, is limited to empirical data, and it's not more warmly felt uh, with language that could it really beat at the heart of, of the capitalists, which is exploiting opportunity, what they consider opportunity or unregulated industry or, or environments. This is an unregulated issue, particularly with many of the things that all three of you have discussed. And I, I really, uh, really would like to, to see more address that would bring more people into it through, and, and propaganda doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a correct word, but I think a, a way of bridging an understanding that would be an introduction, because certainly the pages and pages and pages of, 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 of uh, empirical data that you're working with can be a little laborious to the average individual. Second, my, my question is, if I take a look at Elmira, for example, radon gas is just above what it should be a normal level. If I take a look at Utica, Utica is uh, running at about eight or nine times what, it, what normal levels would be. If I take a look at other industries that might be created because gas like that would become the, uh, uh, would, would, you know, it would become part of the ambient issue. Uh, that becomes a, a, an added cost for the entire community that, that we're not necessarily anticipating, and whether it's radon or many of the things that you've described in each of your, your talks and papers, uh, I just want to know how impacting can some of this be on our communities that we don't recognize the actual cost? And if you, even if we just use radon, if I take a look at all the counties, Erie County is terrible with radon gas right now. So, Help us. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, so to the issue of radon, um, radon is actually a breakdown product of uranium. And because um, this inland ocean that we live over top was not uniform in its currents and it had different troughs and things like that, when the uranium from that mountain range flowed into this inland ocean, it didn't distribute itself evenly. There were certain funnels where it tended to, to deposit itself. And so some parts of New York have more trouble with radon than others. The fact that it's able to wend its way up from the shale into our basements and into our homes and create a health risk shows us that even without fracturing our bedrock and shattering it, um, there are fissures and cracks and the connection between that deep world down there and the sunlit surface where we live. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer after tobacco. It kills 22,000 people a year. None of those people die easily. They use up many, many dollars of health care costs and a lot of suffering and loss of productivity. The problem, as you suggest, is that we can't say, oh, here's the victims from radon because we shattered the shale, right? We can't say that because they'll die of lung cancer. We don't know if it's because of the coal burning power plant, um, because their dad smoked when they were a kid, or if it's because of the radon from the shale. And so the victims are anonymous. That's where I think as scientists, data really matters, because, and, and economics really matter, because we can say, all right, we're never going to know that we're now going to the funeral of the guy who died from radon from the shale. But what we can say is that um, before we make the decision, we can forecast how many extra radon deaths will happen over a 30-year period. Our government hasn't run those numbers yet. So part of my job as a health professional is to say to my governor, you can't do this until you tell us if fracking is going to kill more people than it employs. And you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to run it as a real time human experiment. We have the, the statistics to plug into complex simulation models that would tell us this many more people will get radon induced lung cancer. We'll never know who they are, but each of those people we require, let's say, $20,000 of health care costs, probably more than that. But there are numbers in, in the field of medical economics to tell us, and we could actually come up with numbers 
for how much radon-induced deaths from fracking is going to cost us, how much more childhood asthma, how much is that going to cost, how many more kids are going to go to emergency rooms, how many more vehicular fatalities will there be. We can run all those numbers. That has not yet been done. So part of the power of science, I think, is to argue uh, with our, our, uh, our government to say, uh, we need you to do that science first before we move forward. That's the power of data. Now, that being said, science and economics are only w one way of approaching the world, and I truly appreciate your other point and would love to talk to you more about creating narratives that attract more different kinds of people. I am more than just a scientist, and I have very passionate feelings about other aspects of this problem. I got into the field of public health in the first place because I myself was diagnosed with environmental cancer at the age of 20, um, bladder cancer. And it turns out that there are bladder carcinogens in my hometown drinking water wells. It took me four years and a lot of scientific sleuthing to unco uncover all that. Um, so it's my personal experience as a cancer survivor and knowing that 33 years, I was diagnosed at 20, I'm now 53, 33 years of being a cancer patient and watching the inside of my body being projected over and over again on the big screen television while I'm lying up in stirrups undergoing a cystoscope and the particular kinds of suffering that that and humiliation that's involved in that, that, that makes me determined that no person should have to go through that because they were contaminated without their consent that that's just fundamentally wrong. It, it helps guide my, my science. Um, the problem, I think, for us in the scientific community is that if we reveal too much of the spiritual side of ourselves or the ethics that guide us, that it's seen as being um, not objective to our science. I think there's a way of being objective and being moral at the same time, but often I serve them up separately. <laughs> I just want to say something to the first comment you made. Um, I do a lot of these talks, we all do, um, and uh, this audience looks very much like all of my audiences, you're absolutely right. Um, I work with, and we all do, work with a number of grassroots organizations who are out there trying to educate people. And we are finding that the polls are um, going over to the side of more and more people are opposed to fracking. Uh, and I th we think it's a result of education that we're all out there trying to educate. Um, so we will continue that if you perhaps as a member of the clergy might have some ideas as to how we can get to more people and a more diverse group, more di diverse audience, please um, let me know. You've got my email. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before we have another question, I just want to mention uh, the committee that put this together. Uh, we were sort of referring to ourselves as the Fab Four for a while, because we were all working so hard together and doing, <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, part of that is the cookie, cookies in the back that you've all been enjoying. So if you have a couple bucks in your pocket and you want to help us out by giving us some money for the cookies. We'd be very happy for that. Um, there's been, there's been uh, the copying of the uh, handouts that you've gotten and, um, and the fact that we did pay for the church hall. We're not a not, I'll be straight up, we are not a separate not-for-profit not organization. We are a small group of concerned citizens that have been working together for about mm, since last summer, not even a whole year. And this has been our biggest effort to bring public education to all of us, um, including ourselves, so that we know more about what we're dealing with. Thank you. Yes? Yes, please. I want to thank all three of you for coming. I thought I knew a lot about this subject. I didn't. Uh, Dr. Barth, this one's for you. Um, has anyone ever gone down to some of the drill sites and actually taken a census with regard to 
how many out-of-staters are working on those pads and how many locals do they really hire? And I'm not just talking about necessarily, you know, Chesapeake's drill pad somewhere down in Pennsylvania. I'm talking about all the additional support industries around Schlumberger, Gasfield Specialties, the folks at the Holding Point, uh, somebody's unloading the rail cars, all that conglomerated. How much is out-of-state workers and how much are local people? I don't, th I am not aware of a comprehensive um, data collection effort to, to quantify that. However, I have seen various estimates and they range from anywhere from 30 to 90 percent of out-of-state workers, um, often depending on the, f the stage of the development of the, of the well pad. Um, so it starts very high out-of-state and as time goes on, some of those people will become local and um, over time, as the, uh, the well is producing um, and all the major work has been done on it, they're more local people. Um, but I think it would be great to have exactly that kind of data. My question is for Sandra. Um, I've been dealing with, uh, uh, we have a drop-off for the sand that uh, currently is being used in Pennsylvania. And I live approximately two blocks away from it. On a summer day, wind is carrying that four stories up in the air. Depending on the direction, it's going all the way through the city. How concerned should I be? And do you have any recommendations on anything I can do about it? I don't, I can't tell you how concerned to be because again, we've never done the research on silica dust exposure in a general population. We know how much silica dust uh, um, exposure affects a worker who's working an eight hour shift. We've never exposed a general population around the clock to this before. Um, the, as with asbestos, what you need to worry is not the stuff that you can see. It's the invisible stuff that's so small that it's just like a little cr invisible crystal that it will respire deep, deep down into your lungs. Um, when I traveled to the place where they mine the sand near my mother's house in Illinois along a beloved, for me, part of the Illinois River Valley, um, when I finished my travel there, my, my rental car was covered in what looks like the flower that I showed you, it's uh, like whole wheat flour. And every crotch of every tree, you know, was filled with this stuff. So it, it, um, it does blow a long way. The people who have the best data are actually folks in Wisconsin where the mining is happening. And they're actually um, lay people who have equipped themselves with monitors and are measuring silica dust at various distances away from the, the site where they're storing and processing it. So I would put you in touch with those folks. There's also a brand new documentary movie out called The Price of Sand, which is all about sil silica sand used in fracking operations, where it goes, the communities that are being exposed. And if you simply Google The Price of Sand, it will take you to the trailer and it will also take you to the grassroots group who is pioneering the health effects piece of it on silica. And those folks come uh, out of Wisconsin. So the price of sand. Yes, um, right there. Thank you. Um, actually, thank you for all the presenters. I have more of a rhetorical question um, that hasn't been really addressed, and I kind of like to go back to the larger picture of things when looking at issues. Um, and it's actually, why are we fracking? And I think that's uh, an interesting question if you think about it. Um, one of the reasons, just in my research, that I think we are fracking now more than, more than ever is because of the depletion of our oil reserves around the world. Um, and as you said, Dr. Ingrafia, in the beginning, water is life. I think here in the United States, oil is life. Um, and we only have about 2% of the reserves, yet we use 25% of it. So um, one of the questions that I have is, in thinking of fracking and talking about all of these health concerns specifically, is it worth is it worth doing this? Because looking at it from what I've read, we get minimal amounts of gas. It's much more unsafe 
than getting crude oil from the ground. It's not mobile, it's not easily accessible. You've already talked about going a mile into the earth and then a mile to the left. Um, so looking at that, and also one other thing is that you also are using much more oil, much more energy resources to get this gas, this methane gas, than actual the gas that you actually get. So I'm just trying to you know, look at the larger picture. Is it really worth getting this methane gas? Or should we be investing in renewable energy sources, as you, had, as you had mentioned earlier? And how do we convince our politicians when they go up against big oil companies like Exxon and Shell Mobile, uh, excuse me, Shell and Mobile? Um, so you know, they're thinking in, in terms of big business money. They're not looking to the future um, of, the, of the world in, in the United States. So I just have, that, that's what I wanted to propose to the three of you. Thank you. I'll try to address that first, and, and your question is exactly the right one, the big picture. Is it worth it? And the reason why three of us with totally disparate backgrounds, the only commonality we have is that we're all good looking. <laughs> He's such an Italian. We all have PhD after our name. Um, the reason why we had three of us with disparate backgrounds, biologist, economist, frack engineer, is to try to address the totality of why collectively we think it's not worth it. We can't think of a good reason to make it worth it. You touched on a lot of things. Um, there is, but let me just clear up one little discrepancy. You cannot directly substitute the use of natural gas for oil. So you frequently hear it's patriotic to drill a gas well, bring a soldier home. Be patient. And I don't have my glasses on. I'm going to tell you a little story. I was at a conference at Harvard last week. I was at a conference at Harvard last week, and uh, one of the talks was given by an undersecretary of defense. And the title was Energy for the Warfighter. And she showed the following image. Yeah. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> that is a mortar pit in Afghanistan. So let's talk about patriotism and energy independence for a minute. Mortar pits in Afghanistan need a lot of power, 500 kilowatts. 90 soldiers, men and women, live in that mortar pit, and they're responsible for protecting all the other soldiers within a couple miles of that mortar pit. For years, the Department of Defense organized convoys to bring diesel fuel to the mortar pit to run diesel generators to supply 500 kilowatts of electricity. What happens to the convoys on the way to the mortar pit? IED. Yeah. Somebody in the Department of Defense said, well, that's stupid. <laughs> Got the point? Yeah. I'd like to add something to that as well. You're, you say, why are we fracking? Well, you have to realize the oil and gas industry is very powerful, very rich, and it wants to make a lot of money. Uh, you've probably heard that the gas industry has um, applied uh, for a number of permits to, uh, to create uh, liquid natural gas export terminals from our current import terminals. And uh, if they are allowed to export a lot of natural gas, um, and if they can in fact produce it here, um, they will um, stand to make a lot more money by exporting it. The price of natural gas on the global market is about three times the price here, and they, wanna, they just want to make that money. I find it very disturbing to think about that we could be jeopardizing um, our health, our environment, and our economy here in New York uh, in order to um, provide and support the uh, economic development of China and uh, high profits for the gas industry. Thank you. Um, thank you. And our councilperson, Nicole Parks. Good evening. I want to say thank you to everyone, the Fabulous Four, and all those that supported the Fabulous <laughs> Four for bringing these wonderful individuals here to give us this great information. 
as a health professional, I'm a registered nurse by trade, and I also work in community health in addition to city council. Um, my question is, um, has there been any thought about how to incorporate the health impact assessment with the current local community assessments that are being mandated by the New York State Department of Health right now? Currently, we are working on these health assessments, and some of the ones that we've kind of tweaked and developed based on other counties um, don't have any specific questions or lead-ins to extract information and concerns from citizens about fracking, about the impact. So aside from this forum, there's a large, the larger community still doesn't know anything about fracking except for what they see on commercials. So um, can you speak to that, Doctor, about, about the health assessments and incorporating the, the two differences? Yeah, I don't know of any um, attempt to incorpor you know, incorporate those two. Um, the, the health impact assessment that we're asking for would um, use the data that's available to us. So for example, we could predict with a fair amount of accuracy the amount of air pollution that would be created if we plug some numbers in. We know that each uh, well requires about 6,000 truck trips, about between one and 2,000 of those are diesel. Um, we know how much hazardous air pollutants, more or less, a range anyway, comes off of any one wellhead. Uh, we know a range of air pollutants that come off of condensers and compressor, uh, comp condensers and compressor station sites. So we could then determine how much ozone, extra ground level ozone is created and uh, use those numbers to calculate increased risks for uh, asthma, increased risk for preterm birth, increased risks for uh, heart attack and stroke. And you're correct to say that if we had local data, then those numbers would be more meaningful. Because if we knew that in a community, um, the preterm birth rate were already a certain proportion, right? Um, and, and we knew that small for date births um, were, let's say, 10%. Um, and if we decrease birth weight anymore, you would tip a certain number of babies into, um, in, into a dangerous situation. Having local data would only help make those numbers more accurate. Um, we're nowhere close to that. We haven't even gotten the Cuomo administration to agree that we should do a health impact assessment. In fact, they told us they're not doing one. So what's standing in the stead of a health impact assessment is um, a health review which means only that the Department of Health is reviewing the work that the Department of Environmental Conservation has already done to determine if it's done a good enough job or not. So reviewing pre-existing data, especially data that was not done by health professionals but by the Environmental Department, um, is a lot different than funding, um, funding the kind of study that you and I are, are now talking about. So officially, we've been denied our request, and we are simply waiting for um, the results of this environmental review being done by our commissioner of, of health, uh, Dr. Shaw, uh, and his team. And that's been done with no transparency at all, under a complete, um, complete secrecy. We don't know um, the scope of that study. We don't know what the reviewers were charged with reviewing. We don't know what documents they've been, they are reviewing, which is absolutely unusual to me. In 20 years of doing environmental health, I've never heard of a secret public health study. It's like <laughs> jumbo <laughs> shrimp or something, right? So uh, I don't, none of, us, uh, none of us professionals in New York State have seen what they're doing. So we, we don't know how to think about it or, or we, we don't know what it will be, um, but we're all kind of just waiting for it to appear. It's a very odd moment right now. Yep. On your website, is there a list of the health professionals that are a part of this? There are, and uh, yeah, I want to tell you about that. So you've got in the back this handout, which is our, about what a comprehensive health impact assessment is, um, which is the, the main thing we've been asking for for two or three years in a very steadfast way. But then um, in, on the website, which is up here at the top, concernedhealthny.org, um, we've used that as a clearinghouse of information of 
all the peer-reviewed studies that we know on the health effects of fracking. So we've tried to make it a to-go-to -to place, and you don't need to be a health professional um, to understand it. So we've got you know, all the letters we've ever written the governor, all the summaries, all, but also op-eds and uh, easy to understand stuff along with the peer-reviewed stuff. It's all kind of categorized up there. Um, so, for example, we have some emerging data we're paying attention to in Pennsylvania showing that mothers who are pregnant and live near drilling and fracking operations during their pregnancy tend to have lower birth weight children, babies who are lower birth weight and also have lower APGAR scores, which is a measure of newborn responsiveness at birth. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, and so we, and, and actually the differences are very large. There are one statistic, one uh, standard deviation different, which if you know statistics is pretty, pretty impressive. Um, so those are uh, preliminary data, but we've po posted those up there with other stuff that's more definitive, and then we've kind of categorized it to, to say, well, the, here's the, the emerging stuff, here's what we know for sure, here's what we're keeping an eye on, and, and, and stuff like that. So we do hope that, that that will be helpful to you. Thank you. Uh, we have, we're getting quite late. I'd like to take, um, uh, if somebody has a really quick question, we'll take the quick question first. We have two here, and the mayor also, whom I'd love to hear, to ask a question. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks guys for a wonderful show. Um, it's commonly stated that natural gas is a bridge fuel. This is coming out of Washington even today through the president's designee for uh, secretary of uh, energy, and I just wonder if there's any precedent for the idea that you would make huge investment in infrastructure that would then, at some undisclosed point in the future when renewables became viable, would be abandoned in favor of the newer, better technology, or are they just being disingenuous? Is Pollyannaism afoot? What's, what's your opinion on that? All of the above. <laughs> I, um, clearly, uh, large in capital investment in infrastructure um, is not uh, working toward a short-term bridge to anything. Um, it's just obvious. Um, uh, are they being disingenuous? I, maybe. I think, again, the, uh, the oil and gas industry is powerful. Um, you know, I think that's the answer to a lot of these questions that we think are unanswered. Um, but there have been studies. I think the AS, is it called the Aspen Environmental Group, um, had done a study um, that, I, I could, don't remember the details, but they had some numbers um, showing how much the investment, <sighs> converting coal power plants to natural gas power plants, the dollars required, um, and how much that would prevent investment in renewables. There are actually some numbers out there. I, I used to have these numbers on prior presentations, but I don't remember them. Um, but that is a source if you want to get that information. Some people have studied that. Thank you. Thank you. you had I'm a civil engineer. I know bridges. <laughs> there are three parts to a bridge. There's the near-term abutment where you are. There's the far-term abutment where you want to get to. And there's the thing that you don't want to fall into along, along the way. <laughs> So we're asked to believe that the thing that we don't want to fall into is the thing that's making the bridge. I don't understand that. Not only is he really cute, but he's witty, too. I, I, I. <laughs> All right. I, I appreciate that wit. And I have to say that for all of the people that I speak to, about fracking, against fracking, all the people in the audience. I'm actually nervous. So I, I look at fracking in European countries, and there are several countries that have banned it. I get a lot of letters from these people saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, until I realize those companies are over in this country doing it to us. So we're OK with rape, pillage, and plunder, right? It's all about the money. And I, I don't agree with that. But what have those European countries done, or what do they know that we're not using to process that here to get away from fracking? If they're not doing it there, why can't we look at some of their information to use that to our advantage? 
I work with some of the people in England. They haven't banned it there in England, but um, they, and, and I worked with uh, the young woman who's doing a documentary in South Africa. Um, and um, in both cases, they're looking to us. They use our stuff. Um, so we're giving them all the information and they're making their decisions. Mm. Mm. Oh, we have a question. This gal first. Oh. And one more thing. <laughs> you mentioned uh, so many you know, foreign corporations buying up our shale gas assets, which also means a lot of the profit is going abroad. It's not staying here, just so everybody knows that. Right. OK. OK. Al has had his hand up for a while, so this is Al. Here I just thought uh, I might mention this. I live in Troy, <laughs> Pennsylvania, right outside of Mansfield. Uh, these people are heartless. <laughs> They were dropping seismographs around two years ago. And when I asked them what they were doing on my property, they said they're going to make us rich. <laughs> I won't tell you what I told them, not the way I told them. <laughs> uh, but approximately around a year ago, my toilets turned black. So I will tell you they will get to you. The drilling was approximately a half a mile down the road. Um, I was totally shocked. Uh, I'm sure this won't surprise you. There was a sign on the way to Mansfield that said, if you're having any trouble with your wells, please contact. I don't remember the lawyer's names. But I will guarantee you they'd either have a house in Hawaii now on the ocean or cement slippers because they're gone. You can't find them anywhere. Uh, I don't trust these people as far as I could throw anybody. I mean, they're just amazing what they're doing. Uh, that whole area has changed dramatically. I've been there, I've had the property over 40 years. Um, they won't do anything for your wells unless you had your water checked prior so that you could prove that something was there afterwards. So in my opinion, needless to say, it's a very dangerous situation. They're playing Russian roulette with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We have uh, two questions on this side. And if it could be short. Yeah, I just want to ask Dr. Ingrafia, he mentioned that the latest study that he's done, I think that's nearly completed, about the benefits of renewables in New York State or something. What is the name of it, and when is it available now, or when will it become available? Thank you. Uh, the, the paper that uh, Dr. Barth and I were referring to uh, appeared in the journal Energy Policy about two weeks ago, and it's publicly available, and what we need to do is tell everybody how to get to it somehow. Uh, www.psehealthyenergy, all one word, psehealthyenergy.org. If you go to that website, you can download the paper. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you all for uh, coming to Elmire and welcome to uh, Shimon County. Um, I'm a volunteer for the Community Science Institute. And I just wanted to mention that uh, they're having an information session uh, May 13th from 6.30 to 8 at the uh, Steel Memorial Library. We uh, test water, and we uh, definitely uh, need more volunteers. So if you could make that, that'd be great. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any data on residual waste in landfills? Uh, they're they're dumping this stuff in our landfill here in Chemung County, and <clears throat> I, have, I haven't heard any mention uh, about that tonight, so I was just kind of wondering what you guys uh, knew about it, if you had any information to share. Um, do you know how many times the three of us have said tonight, we don't know? So much for PhDs, right? <laughs> I, was, I was involved in the case that was, civil case that was brought here in Shimon County, what, four years ago? Uh, you know which one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Geez, why are they taking drill cuttings from Pennsylvania and shipping them 100 miles to New York and putting them in our landfills because our landfills didn't have radiation detectors and Pennsylvanians do? <laughs> and of course, we lost that case and DEC argued against us and for the industry. 
Um, and what we argued was you're taking processed materials, drill cuttings and drilling mud, and we don't know what's in it. And we're putting it into a landfill in New York, and we don't, again, we don't know what the long-term effects are of that stuff getting out of the landfill for which it was not designed. Landfills were not designed for drill cuttings, okay? And we don't know if it does get out and gets into an underground source of drinking water, what the public health effects would be. So once again, we don't know. It's another one of those not yet done scientific studies that we should have had done before we opened the door to do it. Um, before we do anything else, I would like to ask, did someone, women? In the women's restroom, uh, there is a notebook left behind. Yes. Does this belong to anybody? Yes, no? Um, we're going to leave it at the church office? OK. Excuse me, Kay. Um, as a member of the Fab Four, I'm going to use my right to ask a question to the group, if I could, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've heard uh, it, just very recently in the last couple of weeks, I believe it is, we've heard about um, the big uh, meeting of the minds down in Pennsylvania, environmental groups, gas industry folks coming together and shaking hands and say, this is how you know, we can do this together. Um, could you address what that, what that is about and if we should believe in that or if we, we should, uh, is that smoke and mirrors? The Center for Sustainable Shale Development. <laughs> I'm not trying to be witty here, but th there's, there, are, there are public relations masters working in the industry. And one of the games that you play in counterinsurgency is to use the other, other people's words against them. Green fracking fluids. Recycling drill waste. Sustainable shale, masterful. I couldn't have invented it myself, I mean, if I thought about it. So, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Sustainable shale, literally the shale reproduces itself. Maybe all those little bugs <laughs> are speeding up, right? They're making shale faster now. It, it took them 400 million years the first time. Maybe they can do it in four years now. Okay, so CSSD was an idea invented by John Hanger. I'm giving you the history, and it's factual. If you have an objection, if you don't think it's correct, let me know. Everybody remember who John Hanger was? No. Everybody know who Jane Han John Hanger is doing now? He's running for governor of Pennsylvania. My opinion, and it's only my opinion, and I'm stating this opinion as a private citizen, John is looking for greenwashing. He's looking for forgiveness. He wants to be able to go forth in the public in Pennsylvania and say, yeah, you think I was responsible for all the bad things that happened in Pennsylvania because of Marcellus, but look what I have done. I've invented the Center for Sustainable Shale Development, and we're establishing very high level bar that the industry is going to have to pass. And so he convinced one major environmental group, which happens to be the largest, the Environmental Defense Fund, <laughs> um, and a couple of uh, philanthropic organizations uh, to put some money in and, and work with four gas companies. And I point out that there are currently between 60 and 70 gas companies operating in Pennsylvania, so it's not like there was an overwhelming rush to join this center. Uh, and they said, let's promulgate, let's discuss over a two-year period in which everything was done behind closed doors. Nobody else was invited to the party. Um, they came up with 15 new standards, for example, we will recycle frac fluid to the highest extent possible voluntarily. <laughs> Why is that tough? Um, we will use cement and casing in our wells <laughs> to prevent wells leaking. Remember what I said about the word prevent? Yeah. We've always used cement and casing in wells. Why is the proposal to use cement and casing in wells to prevent leaking tougher than the regulation already in place in Pennsylvania. The point I'm making is that these 15 proposed tough regulations do not set a new bar, they set a new low bar. And now we're giving the industry, or at least some elements of the industry, an excuse to voluntarily conform to a set of regulations that aren't regulations. They have no teeth. They're not legal. 
They're not prosecutable. They're a voluntary standard. Uh, I don't like it. Um, it's something that uh, is having a very deleterious effect on places like New York State and other states where, in other countries and provinces where shale gas development is under moratorium or ban. Um, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Uh, I wish it would. I wish all gas and oil companies would sign on to a set of really, really tough regulations and agree, as they should, to fund uh, inspectors by firing people from their own organizations who can become inspectors and then pay them at least as much as they were paying them and then agreeing to pay fines, as I said before, that are proportional to the harm done. Uh, I don't see any of that in CSSD. It's just more of the same, let's invent a new Ten Commandments and hope for the best. Fifteen Commandments. Well, for, from my perspective, I think that da the real danger of it, I mean, it, it, I, I underscore everything that Dr. Ngothi says, first of all, sustainable shale makes no logical sense to me. Um, but I think that the real danger is that those of us who then maintain an abolitionist perspective on fracking look like we're non-cooperative, right? So the idea is that now we see industry cooperating with an environmental group and it sets this model and everyone likes the lion and the lamb to sit down together. So those of us who are not sitting down together, then the narrative is that we're uncooperative. Um, Sometimes cooperation isn't what's required. Um, those who lived in the 1930s in Europe who cooperated with Nazi Germany are not the, those who are considered heroes now. It was the non-cooperative ones, right? Um, and so that's what I'm worried about, that it's being used to isolate us in New York and make us look like we're n n antisocial or something, that we can't also sit, sit down at the table. Thank you. This is, um, this is a delight to us, having experienced this for the first time, and this is a small group of people wanting to, especially to uh, have an impact on the Elmira community itself. And it's a very, it's a small start, but there was something that started earlier, and I'm looking at some of the participants in this. Um, the past year, we have, uh, during the past year, we also have gone out and talked to people in the community all over the community uh, as far as our little legs could carry us for a while until the weather turned bad. And uh, we had, what, 800, at least 800 people that we spoke with and uh, who were very interested in a moratorium on fracking. Uh, very interested in a moratorium on fracking uh, in, in Elmira. Uh, what I found, and th this question about what kind of language can you use, the approach that we took when we talked with people it was a very, very simple one, and close to all of our hearts, which was, are you concerned about the water that you drink and that your family drinks? Is this a concern that you might have? And that we didn't immediately say, what do you think of hydrofracking? Uh, and that was somebody who lived, was at Hawthorne Court or somebody said, here's a piece of advice for you, why don't you try this? And we immediately did. And the response was pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It was immediate understanding of where we all stood. So from my personal perspective, once again as a citizen who really believes in democracy, it's about being informed and then acting upon your information uh, in a responsible way. And it's, it's an unfortunate thing that we can't always have everything that we want, but we are always in that position of making decisions and choices. And so from, I make a decision for myself, I also make a decision for my family, and I'm representing several generations of it as I stand here. I am making a decision to work toward drinkable water and a sustainable community of people who understand the wealth that we already have and that we can build upon. And I think that the people who have worked on this project with us, whether it has been during the past year or most recently putting this together, are very much in tune with that. And um, I'd like to thank Margie and Doug and Colleen uh, very, very much for all the hard work that's been put into making this evening happen. And thank you so much for showing up. Thank you.
Thank you.